After eliminating the Denver Rockets in five games, the next hurdle for the defending ABA champions was the Utah Stars, the regular season Western Division champions. The six-game Utah series turned out to be extremely physical underneath, with such individual battles as George McGinnis and Cincy Powell, Darnell Hillman and Willie Wise, and, of course, Mel Daniels against Zelmo Beatty. But steady performances by the Pacers' front line gave Indiana control of the boards and the inside game and, ultimately, the series. Throughout the series, the Pacers were led by the great play of George McGinnis and Donnie Freeman. But it was Freeman, the likable six-year veteran who had never been in the championship series, who was the key to the Pacers reaching the finals for the fourth time in the last five years. Freeman averaged over 20 points per game against the Stars' Jimmy Jones, who is regarded as one of the top guards in basketball. Only Freeman himself could describe his emotions at that moment. You know, I don't usually show very much emotion, but at that time, I had... Uh... We had just defeated Utah and uh, gotten into the championship series of the, of the, uh, the league. So uh, this was my first time ever getting that far. And then we beat the team that uh, I, was, I had played on before. So it was kind of a dual purpose there for me. I'm Joe McConnell, the radio voice of the champion ABA Indiana Pacers. With Denver and Utah out of the way, the final team that stood between the Pacers and their third ABA championship was the powerful Kentucky Colonels. The Colonels had defeated the Eastern Division champion Carolina Cougars in a grueling seven-game series to reach the finals. An Indiana-Kentucky series was to be a backyard series, the I-65 series. Plus, there's always the natural rivalry. Anytime teams from Indiana and Kentucky get together for basketball, whether it's high school, college, or professional. As the series opened in Freedom Hall in Louisville, Kentucky, the Pacers' major concern was the Colonel's awesome duo of Artis Gilmore and Dan Issel. Plus the backcourt of Louis Dampier and Rick Mount, the former Pacer. Both teams had potent offenses and were also very aggressive on defense. The series would be a very physical one, and the battle of the boards would be vital. In the first game, Kentucky made a fine comeback after trailing by 15 points at the half. Kentucky coach Joe Mullaney and his team appeared to have the game well under control with a six-point lead late in the game. But five straight baskets by Mel Daniels cut the Colonel lead. Tough defense by the Pacers set up a key three-pointer by Roger Brown. And the game was tied at 100 with only a minute to play. On the Colonel's next possession, reserve guard Jimmy O'Brien shot sailed over the rim. Dan Issel grabbed the ball but could not get a shot away, so tossed it back to O'Brien, who hit a 20-footer. But Bobby Leonard was screaming that the 30-second shot clock had expired before the shot. Following a discussion, the officials agreed. An Indiana error gave the ball back to Kentucky, and now the Pacers' defense was put to the test. It was superb. With the Colonels unable to get the ball inside to either Gilmore or Issel, Walt Simon was forced to take a 20-footer outside that missed. George McGinnis picked up the loose ball to send the game into overtime. What a way to start an Indiana-Kentucky series. In the five-minute overtime, the two teams traded baskets until less than a minute remained. And the game tied at 107. The Pacers ran the clock down. Freddie Lewis drove the middle and challenged a seven-foot, two-inch Gilmore. 
He arched the ball over Gilmore for the bucket that put Indiana on top for good. Kentucky had one more chance, but Dan Issel missed a 15-footer and Mel Daniels grabbed the rebound to seal game one for Indiana. Freddie Lewis led the Pacers with 29 points and a club playoff record 13 assists for the game. Games two and three can be summed up in two words. Artis Gilmore. In the second game, the seven foot two inch giant from Jacksonville dominated the Pacers with 29 points, a series high 26 rebounds, and seven key block shots. Big man also received good support from Dan Issel, who tossed in 28 points. Game three at the Coliseum in Indianapolis. Gilmore came back with 28 points, 16 rebounds, plus seven more block shots, including the game saver. Kentucky was nursing a comfortable seven-point lead until two baskets by Mel Daniels and a Bill Keller free throw cut the margin to two points with 50 seconds left. Dan Issel missed from 18 feet, and the Pacers grabbed the rebound, and McGinnis headed up court with a tying basket. Yeah, that's probably one shot I won't forget. Uh, uh, I would like to say it was a great play on Artis Gilmore's part. Uh, uh, it, 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 it makes you feel kind of bad when you have the ball in the last few seconds of the ball game and you have a chance to win it and you blow it. Despite trailing 2-1 in the series, Bobby Leonard was optimistic because of the play of Darnell Hillman. Actually, Darnell ended up as the series went along to being the big key because I, th I think he really did an outstanding defensive and uh, rebounding job. Game four was wildly exciting and extremely physical as both teams battled for every step they took. Then the usual pushing and shoving for position between Donnie Freeman and Rick Mount erupted into a fight as both players tumbled to the boards in the midst of several other players. Moments later, the officials added to the excitement by hitting Slick with his second technical as the teams headed off the floor for the half. Leonard was now forced to listen to the second half from the locker room. From his unorthodox coaching position, old pro Gus Johnson led the Pacers to victory, but discovered that coaching is hard work. And, uh, you know, for me, it was, it was an emotional strain as well as being a mental type thing, because uh, I got so involved in the game that I was like jumping up and down, running up and down the sidelines to the scorekeeper and uh, complaining to the officials about this, banging on the tables, you know, kicking tables, and uh, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't get myself calm enough to sit down and uh, really uh, try and watch what was going on. I guess that was just my way of expressing my feeling towards uh, what was going on on the floor. <laughs> was the brilliant play of the Pacers' two fine young forwards, George McGinnis and Darnell Hillman, that evened the series. McGinnis led the Pacers' attack with 20 points and 13 rebounds. Darnell averaged 17 and a game-high 18 boards and had these comments. Rebounding against this ball club, uh, of course, Mel and I have to screen out 
a lot, and we have to know where one another is, you know, each time on the court. So this game, it just happened to be the ball was coming my way, and uh, I could see Mel was really containing artists quite easily, and uh, I felt like jumping. So, you know, Dan and I were going to battle for a few... Uh, Tied at two games apiece, the series shifted back to Louisville for the pivotal fifth game. To date, the series had been a rugged defensive struggle, and neither team had shot well. Freddie Lewis began the final quarter by hitting a three-pointer to put the Pacers on top, 65-64. Pacers rookie Don Boozy then stole the ball three straight times, resulting in a Lewis layup, two free throws by Freddie, and a Mel Daniels jumper to add to the Pacers' lead. But the Colonels came back to grab the lead until Artis Gilmore picked up his sixth and final foul. George McGinnis hit both free throws, and Indiana trailed by only three. Dan Issel hit a free throw, and Kentucky was back up by four. Then Freddie connected on his second home run of the period to cut the lead to 86-85. The Colonels missed the next time down the court, and Indiana had the rebound. With Gilmore, the league's top shot blocker, fouled out, Indiana went to McGinnis inside. As George pivoted to the basket, the ball slid off his fingertips. As the Colonels put the ball in play, George went from goat to hero. First thing that came to my mind when this play happened uh, in the fifth game is instant replay of game three. Uh, but then again, I, I wasn't at the point of giving up, uh, and I saw a chance to, to, to get the ball, and the opportunity presented itself, and uh, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. But the game was far from over. Kentucky missed from the corner, and Dan Issel fouled Mel Daniels. The Colonel stole the inbound pass, and Jimmy O'Brien's winning layup circled the rim and finally rolled out. After scoring 31 points, Freddie Lewis commented on Game 5. Needed something to pick us up, and I felt like I could be the lifter to this ball team. So when I got my shots, I had decided I was going to take the shots, wasn't going to overpass, but I also was going to try to get the fast break going where this is when we're most effective. So what happened, we came out and we got the ball moving. I was getting the open shots, and the ball was falling for me. The Indiana Pacers were coming back home with a chance to win their third ABA crown for the first time in front of their home fans. The Coliseum was packed with a 16th standing room only crowd of the year, and the air was so thick with excitement and tension, you could cut it with a knife. The Pacers just had to win. Anytime you're playing basketball in Indiana, the pressure is always so great. It's much greater than it is away from home because our fans expect us to win each and every game at home, which we are trying very hard to do. But there are some times when teams come in here and they're just so high that they just can't be beat. Everything that they do is right. And this is what happened in the sixth game here. The Colonels were not about to roll over and play dead for the Pacers. They played tight, aggressive defense, and they ran well on offense. made a brief run at Kentucky in the third period and trimmed the lead to 78-76. But that was as close as they would get.
Once again, it was the dominance of the big man, Artis Gilmore, that spelled doom for the Pacers. In the three games Kentucky had won, Gilmore averaged 28 points and 21 rebounds per game. In the three games the Pacers won, he managed only 17 points and 13 rebounds. If the Pacers were to win the seventh and final game and repeat as champions, they would have to contain Gilmore. The man with that unenviable job was Mel Daniels. I don't know the, uh, the way I have to play artists is force him as high as possible and keep him away from the basket. Um, because the man is 7'2", uh, it makes it quite easy for him just to turn around and put the ball in the hole. This is my primary game plan. Uh, other than that, uh, and keep him turning right when he's on the left, left hand side of the key. The struggle between the two premier centers of the ABA was a classic. The physical punishment endured by both men was incredible. Despite giving away six inches and 30 pounds to Gilmore, Big Mel still held his own. The seventh and deciding game was in Louisville with the championship on the line. But thus far in the series, the home teams had won only twice, and the Pacers had already won two out of the three games played in the Bluegrass State. After the disappointing loss at home in the sixth game, could the Pacers regroup? Coach Bobby Leonard made some offensive changes for the seventh and final game, and the strategy seemed to be working as the Pacers moved out to a quick 7-0 lead as Donnie Freeman penetrated for five of the first seven points in the game. Pacers' offensive machine was in high gear. jumper from the corner gave the Pacers a six-point lead at the end of the first quarter. In the second period, the Pacers continued to play as they had in the entire playoffs, working hard on defense and moving the ball quickly on offense. Their fine team play was bothering Kentucky and Indiana enjoyed a six-point lead midway through the period. But then Mel Daniels and George McGinnis were both whistled for their third fouls, and suddenly the Pacers had their two All-Stars on the bench with eight minutes left to go in the first half. Gus Johnson replaced Daniels and kept Gilmore at bay as the rugged action continued. Behind the shooting of Louis Dampier, the Colonels charged back at the Pacers. Kentucky took their first lead of the game on a jumper by Wendell Ladner. In the third quarter, the action became even more intense as the pushing and shoving under the basket continued. Play became rougher, too, as Freddie Lewis and Artis Gilmore crashed to the boards as Freddie drove for the basket. Only 
90 seconds into the third period. Daniels picked up his fourth foul and retired to the sidelines again. Moments later, Freddie joined Mel with his fourth personal foul. Now the job of running the Pacers offense was the responsibility of Bill Keller, who'd had a disappointing series to date and was anxious to play well in the final game of the season. And I think going into that seventh game, I just told myself in the locker room before the game, when you get in the game, just be relaxed and play your ball game. And when I did get the opportunity uh, there in the third quarter when Freddie was in foul trouble, I just tried to control the tempo of the game, you know, try to run the break. If we didn't have the fast break, then, then just get the ball and sit on it and run our patterns. And uh, it helped my game tremendously. And I was very pleased after that seventh game because I knew and I felt that I had contributed to that win. And, and I, I think that made up for the entire Kentucky series for me. Indiana blew the game open in the third period. Keller fed McGinnis, who was fouled by Dan Issel, his fourth, and the Pacers were ahead to stay. Moments later, Issel charged into Big Mac and went to the bench with his fifth foul. Kentucky scored only three points the rest of the quarter as the Pacers defense held Kentucky to a record playoff low, 11 points in the third period. George McGinnis outscored Kentucky all by himself by scoring 13 in the decisive third quarter. With Hillman and McGinnis sweeping the backboards and Keller running the Indiana offense, the Pacers were in command. Roger Brown assisted Keller and scored three big baskets himself in the closing minutes, and the Pacers knew the title was only seconds away. Indiana spread out the floor to run the clock down and capture another ABA championship. As the game ended, the pacemates displayed the Indiana slogan for next year. Let's go back now and relive those exciting final moments of championship number three. Don Freeman and Gus Johnson, this was their first title, and Johnson tells how he felt. After playing this game for such a long, long time, you know, uh, they're guys that spent a lifetime in their prospective sports trying to uh, be on a winner, and uh, I've played for 10 years, and uh, it's just uh, a tremendous feeling, you know, like I've got uh, six different kinds of division rings, all-star rings, but never in my life have I ever, you know, been a part of any organization that says you're number one in the world. And uh, this time, in my own way, I shed my own kind of tears. Uh, whereas uh, I just wanted to cry to me. I didn't care for anybody else to, to witness this. It was just a thing that I guess where I was trying to say thank you, God, or, or thank you, Indiana Pacer, Pacers and the fans, or what. But uh, it's just something that uh, you, you can't put in the words, you know, you can't uh, find the right things to say. You only know that uh, you're the best, and uh, to me, that's the most important thing in the world, is to have done many outstanding things in your career and eventually become a world's champion. Now that the Pacers have completed the task of winning three in 73, what lies ahead? 
As the downtown sports arena approaches completion, one can only wonder what the Pacers and Colonels might have drawn if the 18,000-seat arena were ready now. The games were played to capacity crowds in both cities, and Indianapolis, we finished the season with five straight standing room only crowds. With the steel framework up and concrete poured, the Pacers, their fans, and the entire community can only hope that the arena might be finished as the Pacers go for four in 74. Mm -hmm.